Uh, I want to introduce our panelists um, on my left. Thank you. Our um, Dr. Matt Bereza, and he's an assistant professor of psychology and counseling here at Tiffin University. He got his PhD from Ohio State and focuses his research on how food and psychology and human experience intersect. And then in the middle, Dr. Um, David Hogan, a professor of history at Heidelberg. And his book, Selling by the Sack, White Castle and the Creation of American Food, traces the history of the hamburger's rise as a distinctive American culinary and ethnic symbol. Um, and lastly, Dr. Lucy Long, um, author of several books, including Culinary Tourism, Regional American Food Culture, and a lot of articles, has a PhD in folklore from the University of Pennsylvania, and a master's in ethnomusicology, and you have um, and has founded and directed the nonprofit Center for Food and Culture based in Ohio that serves as a networking clearinghouse on all aspects of food in order to promote an understanding of the ways in which food connects us all. So um, I want to start with Dr. Boreda to talk a little bit about his research. You can see if we figure out some connections between these different pieces. Well, thanks, thanks Lee. Um, thanks, uh, Matt Boreda. I'm a professor here at uh, Tiffin University. Um, and first of all, I just want to say um, I, I, it's just wonderful to see people come to um, not only into the gallery to see something like this, but also um, to focus on uh, localism and people that, that there is an interest. Um, I was saying the week before we started, the game went with me uh, to New York City to present this research um, last spring. And the interest there was uh, obvious as well. And so I think it's coming here. And that is great. Um, I, my research started in 2006. I just happened to um, enter into a doctoral program that was very dynamic um, and had a diversity focus. And the my, what eventually became my committee said, you know, we we know it's psychology. We know we have to cover all of the psychology stuff. Um, but I said to them, you know, I have a, um, a an interest, a lifelong history. I grew up on a farm. Um, I've worked in kitchens my entire life, pretty much, um, cooking my way through many degrees. <laughs> and um, and they said, well, yeah, you know, this is a pretty uh, hot topic right now in psychology, is what we eat, where the things we eat come from, and how that affects um, our behavior, our thoughts, our community. And um, I said, all right, well, I would like to somehow put this together. And I eventually went on to do a study. My first study in the area was how the National School Lunch Program is inhibited by uh, corporate governance and um, what it used to be like. And we would be shocked to know what, what it used to be like, um, the, the school lunch program. I have family members growing up on farms in rural areas that were served a pork chop, a fresh baked biscuit, homemade gravy, green beans, a piece of pie, a glass of whole milk, and real butter for their role um, when they went through the United States Department of Agriculture's school lunch. Today, it's a slice of pizza on a styrofoam tray. Well, we started to find out that there were so many interactions between these uh, foods of minimal nutritional value and kids' performance and how they felt about themselves. Very, it really opened my eyes to a lot. And when I got here to Tiffin University, um, I I'm in a department that I feel also is very dynamic as far as research. Um, we, uh, pretty much all of us, are interested in many different things, are encouraged to research and go out and, and really um, grow the areas that we are interested in. And I've been supported. Um, and I, I really owe a, a thanks to um, my department chairs here, Phyllis Watson, um, you know, and the the deans that since I've been here have been very supportive. In fact, um, uh, being able to have student research assistants is a great help. Um, 
and I'm, I'm hoping it was a good experience. And I know it was because they came along and we had a good time. But, but since I've been here, I've been researching, um, looking at more, uh, a more in-depth study on where the foods are coming from and how they're grown and distributed. Um, and that's what I, I'm not sure how we eventually met got interested. Somebody said, you know, there's somebody here on campus that has made a movie. <laughs> and as soon as somebody says that to me, I'm like, oh, I want to meet that person. I, I want to be in a movie. Um, <laughs> but we, um, we started um, this collaboration uh, with food and localism and where food comes from. And uh, I had been doing pretty much the same research without the artistic piece, I've been doing qualitative ethnography, going out into the field and asking people in bakeries and restaurants and uh, in offices, food distribution, distribution offices, how can we make this better? How does, how does a local food stuff or piece um, that is produced within a 50 mile radius of your home, how does that change your dynamic with food? Do you feel better? with using these foods? Um, how has this changed your life? Um, and what could it do for you? And the kind of things that I was hearing, when the interest was uh, was very exciting. It was, it was, uh, it really indicated to me that there was this, this piece about how we're connected to our food that people really want to get closer. So I'm in doing a little bit of collaboration now. Lee and I are talking about some different areas. We have uh, preliminary research that's been accepted um, in Ann Arbor for the spring to present on um, photoethnography, going in and taking a look at some of these places. What, what worked, what did not work? Um, can we get local foods to people? What will it do for them? And then we can have these beautiful images and we can get into this new type of research where research is now being presented online. Five years ago, in Research One universities, that is, they would be like, what? You know, even when I was doing my doctoral program, everything was that paper model, and we're kind of thinking outside of that. So I'm really grateful um, to run into this, uh, into this forum, into, into Lee's expertise, especially in art. So that's where we're going now. I'm really happy to be here. I'm glad to get to see everybody here. Thanks. Hi, I'm David Hogan from Heidelberg. Um, I'm a historian. I have a, we all have different perspectives on essentially the same topics. And um, my, my research has been on kind of the origin of the hamburger as our national food and how that came about. Um, my thesis, of course, is that the hamburger is our primary ethnic food, for better or for worse. And um, my book actually looked at how that American food was created. And if I can just go through a little of it, I would love to. Um, first of all, we don't know where ground beef comes from. We've probably had it around for thousands of years. You know, every culture has had some form of it. It has never been an elaborate thing, it's never been a refined thing, it's just always just been a very nourishing type of thing. <clears throat> In American culture, we don't really know where it comes from. The hamburger sandwich itself, there's many competing legends. Every region seems to have a competing legend. Uh, Ohio has a guy named Frank Menchus who uh, claims that he was the founder of the hamburger or the inventor of the hamburger. In fact, he also claims he invented the ice cream cone, which probably, um, undermines his validity there. <coughs> Seymour, Wisconsin every year has a major uh, hamburger festival and um, I actually went one year and uh, they claim that Hamburger Charlie, one of their native sons, actually created the hamburger sandwich. Um, the most um, valid claim is probably Louis Lunch in New Haven which uh, started serving hamburger sandwiches in the mid-1890s and is still open and, and thriving today. Okay, where the hamburger comes from really doesn't matter in terms of its integration into American society. Um, it's not really, you know, once again, whoever 
whoever originated it is, and perhaps everybody did it simultaneously, I don't know, but whoever did it, did it in kind of a vacuum, with their own little vacuum. They did it in their own little locale. That does not make for a national food. And hamburger became our national food because of very conscious marketing efforts. And it all happened in 1921 in Wichita, Kansas, another place that I've visited. I've had the National Hamburger Tour. Um, actually, it was kind of fun. But um, in Wichita, Kansas, two guys, one named Walt Anderson, another named Billy Ingram, um, formed a partnership, a very unlikely partnership. Walt Anderson was kind of a ne'er-do-well, you know, he had broken a, he had uh, broken into a number of careers and then kind of fell out of them. Uh, Billy Ingram, however, was a thriving uh, insurance and real estate agent. He was doing well. And he kind of put up the funding. They called their the company White Castle. Has anyone ever been to a White Castle? A couple of uh, very, very hesitant nods there. That's okay. You're in, you're in good company. We can talk about these things. Um, anyway, White Castle began in 1921. White Castle had to overcome a lot of objections to ground beef. Uh, ground beef was considered to be very inferior and tainted. It was considered to be, um, has anybody ever left a cut of meat in their refrigerator and it grew a little green and shiny? And uh, if you were to smell it, it was rather pungent. I would really recommend that you throw it away at that point. However, if you were a butcher at the start of the 20th century, throwing away meat meant you were going to lose money. So what they would do, they would grind it up and they would mix sulfites in, uh, which is a, had access to preservative agents, and they would, it would have more shelf life. They would have it a few more days. Why would they just put preservatives on it before it was bad? But it's they did, they it. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I would prefer that they had never done it at all. But, um, anyway, what happened is that hamburger, the hamburger sandwich, was stigmatized. It was thought to be very unhealthy and dangerous food, and that is what Anderson and Ingram had to overcome. They had to overcome that stigma. And they stressed cleanliness, they stressed uh, the best cuts of beef and everything else. You don't think of that when you think of White Castle today, but um, nevertheless, that was how they marketed it. They, they stressed purity. That's why, the, that's why their buildings were painted white. They wanted to be hospital-like. Well, it worked. In 1921, they were just getting off the ground. By 1929, the present American Restaurant Association proclaimed that the hamburger, remember 10 years before, tainted and horrible, was America's national food. You know, it was extraordinary. Uh, most of us lived through the, um, the computer revolution, or if not that, the cell phone revolution. How it went from being non-existent to suddenly uh, pervasive in every part of life. That's what the hamburger did. It did it that quickly. It just, um, it just um, burgeoned overnight. Okay, what happens from there is, well, people want a little variety. And in 1924, apparently a guy by the name of, I have to read this, Lionel Sternberger. He is the father, the undisputed father of the cheeseburger. Well, when I say undisputed, nothing is undisputed in history. But um, it is said that he was, he was a short order cook in a restaurant in Pasadena, California. And there's a couple different anecdotes about how the cheeseburger came to be. You know, Lionel was responsible for either way, but one was he had become distracted and the burger burned on one side as he was grilling it. Not wanting to throw away, he took a piece of American cheese. How many of you are American cheese fans? One woman very hesitantly raised her hand back there. I don't admit it to anyone else, okay? Um, American cheese, by the way, is not cheese. It's an extruded dairy product. 
It is not legal, it cannot legally be sold as cheese in the United States. But that's all I'll say about that. Okay. Um, Lionel Sternberger put a piece of American cheese, apparently, on this burn patty, on the burn side, gave it to the customer, and the customer was none the wiser. In fact, they liked it. Ah, the second anecdote was a homeless man. And why is homeless? I don't know. Or why it's relevant, I don't know. But a homeless man asked for a piece of cheese on his hamburger sandwich. And Lionel, being the good grill cook that he was, um, said yes. Um, I kind of like the first anecdote better, but you know, you can choose your own. Um, okay, the rest is history, so to speak. Obviously, the cheeseburger is a fixture in our lives. Um, people, many people can't envision a burger without the cheese component on it. Uh, certainly, we see the photos all around us of the different, of the different facets of the burger. Um, I do want to point out that, that they have good cheese. The picture, the picture down there, that is good cheese. That is not American cheese. Okay, why is this significant, though? It's significant, um, well, a lot of things happened coincidentally. The 1920s, a lot of things were happening. 1921, White Castle started. 1921, we started, as a nation, to close the door on open-door immigration. The constant influx of other nationalities, of other cultures, were, was abruptly cut off. Um, Ellis Island was closed. Um, yes, there were, we've obviously had um, different waves of immigration since then, but compared to the, those of the late 1800s and early 1900s, they were minimal. Um, what happened during this time is the hamburger was growing popularity. And Americans were experiencing more of an Americanness. They were sensing more of an Americanness. They were no longer having these outside, these steady outside influences. They are now kind of coalescing as a single ethnicity. The Depression crisis of the 1930s, World War II, brought a lot of people together under one umbrella, one national umbrella, one ethnic umbrella, if you like. Um, the suburbanization, the burgeoning suburbs of the 1950s and 1960s. All of these forces started to do away with the original ethnicities that people felt. Um, Italians became less Italian, Irish became less Irish. Um, at that time, we started to realize something that many of you probably don't even realize today, is that being an American is a very unique is a very unique um, ethnicity. You know, many of you may see yourself as African American, as an Italian American. I, you know, I come from an Irish American background. But really, when, you, when it comes down to it, we are a very homogeneous culture. Most of what we experience, we experience in a very common way. And one of those things we experience, and, uh, a delineator of any ethnicity is the food. And our national food, our common food, our most popular food, is the burger. So when no one was looking between 1920 and 1960, uh, we became one, one people as an ethnic group, and the hamburger became our ethnic food. OK. Oh, uh, Oh, we're running out of time. Oh, yeah. Can I, can I have one more minute? I'll talk fast. Oh, by the way, the reason I realized our ethnic food, I was in a cab in Guatemala, Guatemala City in 1994. And the Guatemalan cab driver said in very broken English, he pointed to Wendy's and he said, American food, huh? And I could have just hugged him. Because it's like everything just became clear to me at that moment. You know, he led me to the understanding that this is truly our ethnic food. Uh, I was going to go on and talk about American um, hegemony and, um, and um, imperialism and whatnot, but we'll save that for another time. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think we could probably, all of us, speak for about three hours, so 
I'm going to I'm going to try to keep this short. Also. I'm programmed to always speak for 50 minutes at a time. <laughs> That's what I do for a living. 45 minutes. <laughs> so, um, okay, just just to give you a little bit of background, uh, can everyone hear me in the back? Is yeah. it, if you can't hear me, hold your hand. But um, I have a PhD in folklore, and just to explain what that is, it's the study of how people develop and maintain meaningful connections with past, place, and other people. So we do, we do study folk tales and folk songs and that type of thing, but it's, it's actually much more serious than that. <laughs> so, and it's very, very relevant to food. How, how many of you eat? on a regular basis. Okay, how, how many of you have memories attached to that food? Okay, does, does some of that food remind you of your own past, your, your personal history? Yeah, do you, do you have certain foods that remind you of individuals? Yeah, certain foods that come from place? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm originally from North Carolina, so the American South, and food is very, very important there, so, you know, I can say, I'm a southerner, I like food, and everyone automatically understands. <laughs> so that's not quite so clear in, in the Midwest. Um, so now, what, what, what I want to talk about, though, is food is meaningful, how does it become meaningful? How does, it, how does it end up carrying memories, carrying emotional attachments? Okay, some of this might seem like we're talking about the realm of psychology, and, and we are kind of going into that. We obviously go in, into history, too. But a lot of this is kind of more like the philosophy of meaning, how, how food takes on meaning for individuals. Okay, and one of the things, and one of the basic things we start out with okay, is food is connected to us very literally because we eat it. Okay? However, we are connected to a past. We all have a history. We all are grounded in some type of place. Okay? And, and hopefully, we all have some sort of connections and relationships to other people. Okay, so, so this food, which also has a history, okay, such as the cheeseburger, okay, and, and frequently when people are talking about food, they don't consider things like the cheeseburger to be food. So, so we, we are including it here. <laughs> so, um, you know, so, so the food has past, place, and people also. Okay, but how, how does this actually work? How do we actually end up assigning meaning and, and how different, not just food itself, but the different activities surrounding the food, how do they acquire meaning? Okay, this is, should we hand out the, sure. this? okay, this is, um, can, can you see this? Oh, that's, <laughs> that's okay, um, okay, this is, this is our tree of connection here. Uh, if we think of each one of us having our own tree, our own food tree, okay, the, the trunk itself, those are the food choices that we are making. Okay, those are our food preferences, those are our tastes. Okay, this, is, this is everything in the present okay, that, that connects to food for us. Okay, but just like a tree, each one of us has roots. Okay? We have a past that is shaping our own particular food culture. Okay, so your ethnicity, does that have an impact on, on what foods you're eating today and what foods you would want to choose? Yeah, okay. You know, when, when, when I was growing up, I had absolutely no contact with Polish culture, Polish food. When I moved to Bowling Green, Ohio, it was like 27 years ago, some people asked us over for a barbecue, and they said, well, first of all, they said barbecue. I thought, great, you know, but 
you had like pig and brown or whatever, you know, because that's what I was used to. So, and then, and then they said, would you, do you prefer hot dogs, kielbasa, or bratwurst? And I said, I have no idea what the second two things are. <laughs> I, I had never heard of that. Okay, however, now, after living here for 27 years, bratwurst and kielbasa, those, those are part of my, my food vocabulary now. Okay, so that's not my ethnicity, but because of the place I'm living in now, that is, that is part of the resource, part of my, um, my, my food vocabulary. Okay, so all of us have these roots, ethnicity, race, our own individual personality. Some people like crunchy peanut butter, some people like smooth peanut butter. This is something a psychologist can have a field day with, or a Freudian analysis. <laughs> so, you know, but we all have personality, personal taste. Okay, this is very important because we each have our own individual history. And then even if you are growing up in a particular place, all the other people around you are sharing maybe that ethnicity, religion, the region, maybe the socioeconomic level, but they all have their own personalities and they all have their own personal histories. So they're all going to come out with their own unique food tree. Okay, now, the important thing about this is, just like in a tree, you have branches with leaves, that's what keeps the tree alive, okay? So that you have to have new food, okay? And the, the leaves we can think of as being um, acts of eating. So this is, there's a whole lot of sociolinguistic performance theory that goes into this, but. <laughs> so, now, so if, every time you make a food choice, or every time you go shopping, or pick up a cookbook, okay, any, any activity connected to food, that's a leaf, a new leaf that you're putting on your tree. Okay, and that leaf, according to the different motivations and things you're interested in right then, you might, you might be purchasing something because it's inexpensive. Okay, and you have to think of cost as the primary motivation. Okay, but these branches are all connected. You know, so let's say you only have a dollar in your pocket and you're really hungry, you run through McDonald's or Burger King. <laughs> okay. okay, so you know that, that's the motivation. Does it have an impact on your health, on the local culture, the local society, and on the environment? Yes. Okay, even though you might not be thinking of it. That might not be what you're highlighting. Okay, so that every food choice we make is having some kind of an impact on these different branches. These are, the, these are the branches of sustainability. Okay, so every time we eat, we are affecting the rest of the world or everyone else. Okay, at, at the same time, we, we can nourish this tree, nourish the roots, through the food choices that we're making, too. Now, one of, the, one of the problems currently is trying to get Americans to eat in such a way that our food system is healthier and more sustainable, and so that our eating habits tend to be healthier for us physically. One of the issues, though, what, what happens if you cut a tree off from its roots? Over. It dies, yeah, it, it falls over, <laughs> crushes a bunch of houses and, and people. Okay, now, in, in the same way, can we, can we simply cut off our past? No, because it's the past that is giving all those memories, all the meaningfulness of, of food to us. Okay, so what we have to do is somehow find a way to, to add in leaves here okay, that, that can then nourish the roots, but allow us to change. Okay, how, how many of you like green bean casserole? Okay, that's a, a standard Midwestern tradition, and I was kind of horrified when I moved out here <laughs> because it was served at Thanksgiving and Christmas, Every church supper, every office potluck, everybody had 
green tea and casserole. You know, coming from the South, it would be considered an insult to offer a food that came out of cans and to offer a food, offer a dish that doesn't take very much time to make. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I didn't know what, I did not know what to make of it. And a lot of people said, well, it's the Midwest. What do you expect? You know, people haven't developed their taste in the Midwest. I said, no, it's not quite that. Other people said, well, just, you know, people are lazy. They don't want to go to all the trouble of making these other dishes. You know, or they don't have the culinary training. Well, I got to know some Midwesterners, <laughs> and a lot of them were very good cooks. They had very good taste. I knew there was more going on. Green bean casserole tended to take on the role of a family tradition. If people had so many memories attached to this dish, it became very meaningful, even though it was something that came from mass-produced foods, mass-processed foods. The recipe was invented in New Jersey in the Campbell Soup Kitchen, okay? You know, but it was something that acquired all these memories okay, that connected people to their roots down here. Okay, so if we want to, to try to change the food system and change the way people are eating, do we tell them no more green bean casserole? No, it would be pretty unhappy. <laughs> okay, but can you change some of the ingredients there? Yeah, yeah. So one, one of my children who's vegan came home and said she was gonna make green bean casserole for, for Thanksgiving. I said, why? She said, mom, it's tradition, we have to have it. We, we've never had it in, in my house. Well, she made, she made it completely from scratch, from organic and, and vegan ingredients. Okay, so she maintained her tree. However, she changed, she changed the leaves so that it was more sustainable and it was healthier. And it, it tasted very, very good. So, okay. Uh, first, I want to see if anyone has any questions, either for the panel in general or for anyone specific. Um, can I touch on the tree thing you brought up a little bit? something that ties in with that a little bit that wasn't mentioned in ice because of the time. It's just the convenience of it. Um, I know like I would much rather would prefer to have something that I cook it myself, but going from school to work to trying to do homework and everything else, it's just so much more convenient to grab something quick and easy as it, even if it isn't as good or as it's healthy. Um, mm -hmm. so I don't I don't know if that ties in. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Yes. Well and um, you know part of part of what's going on in American eating habits, too, is that we, we, we all grow up thinking that we have to be efficient. Time is money. And, and food, historically, has been treated more as fuel for our bodies and as a commodity. And it is seen as something that is not quite as important as work, you know, or you know, other, other activities. So it's kind of shoved aside. Too. And, and so that's, that, that's part of the reason you know, people, people don't make time to make food. So, and the, the, the whole kind of religion of efficiency. <laughs> I'm curious, where does Dave Thomas and the whole McDonald's phenomenon fall into the history of this process with White Castle and then in 1921? Um, start with McDonald's because they, know, they started much earlier. As a hot dog stand, know us. Um, they were they were not revolutionary by any means. They essentially took the White Castle concept and, and refined it a bit. Um, Dave Thomas, however, was absolutely revolutionary because the fast food industry was falling apart in the late 1960s. Uh, all of the fast food companies had been bought up by major corporations that had managed them very poorly. And um, it looked like the industry was just gonna fall apart. And uh, Dave Thomas comes in in 1970 
with an extraordinary concept. I'm going to charge three times as much as everybody else, and I'm going to make a good business. You know, it just uh, it was absolutely illogical. It was it, it looked to investors and everybody else that it was just um, you know it's just a a very very um, untenable um, act on his part. And alas, he sold quality instead of quantity. And uh, not everybody wanted to buy it. You know, uh, fast food, you probably know, is, is marketed, is, is specifically marketed in different tiers in, of in class society. You know, um, uh, Wendy's is still marketed to what you might say to a middle to upper middle class. And they were willing to pay for the, for the better quality. They were willing to pay for the fresher ingredients. Um, so that's where Dave Thomas found his, found his place in the market. You know, logically, he should have been in business for less than a year. And of course, uh, they've consistently been their largest you know, for the past uh, 25 years. Dr. Yeah, I guess I had never thought about how meaningful food is all the years growing up as an American until I married someone from another culture, a Korean culture, and to see the emotional connection to my wife's home dish, she will drive three hours to a, gro a grocery store just so she can get her kimchi, and she must always have her kimchi on hand, and it serves, you know, again, such a meaningful and comfort food, particularly when she, she's stressed. And I never realized that. You know, the Koreans look upon food this is somewhat changing, but food is medicine. It kind of blew me away because we just think it as something pleasurable and something for fuel, but everything in their food and the combinations have to do with toxicity, matching against you know, antidotes for what could be possibly toxic, including ginger to help with your digestion and all these things, which I had never really even thought about. And the, and the other thing that made me think about it, I remember reading some research and it related to international students attending college campuses and, and what would lead to them leaving and going back home. And naturally there were things like you know, support and being able to you know, fit in with the program and the culture, but according to some research, the number one reason why they leave to go back to their home country, and a lot of research is they miss their home food. And that was really suggesting that universities that are serving the international population, if they want to retain international students, they have to provide them the authentic food experience from their home countries, or that will actually psychologically just drive them back home. But I didn't realize it was, it was that important until I read some of that research. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, that's, that's something that tends to be played down in, in the U.S. for us. You know, we're, we're not encouraged to think about food. Um, but so, something else there, too, is that it's not just the food. It's we can talk about food ways, you know, all the activities and conceptualizations around food. So one of, one of the things that we see contrast with other cultures is the way we treat meals. And you mentioned American imperialism. I, I spent a lot of time doing research on food in um, Spain and Ireland and, and in Asian countries. And in Spain, people were incredibly hostile. We'd be, you know, we'd be having a very pleasant talk, and then I'd ask them something about, about their, their food and how it contrasted with, you know, with what they perceived to be American food or whatever. And they would suddenly get very hostile and say, you know, American food is ruining everything. Well, part of what they were talking about is that food and meals, not, not just the food, but meals, in, in that culture are seen as a time for people to gather. So they're very, very social. They're supposed to reconnect with, with each other, but also they pay a lot of attention to, to the food itself, where it comes from. It's a very aesthetic experience. So it ends up being a way to rest and relax and escape from, from the work day. So I, it really amazed me to see people stopping work. You know, one o'clock, everything closed. <laughs> and they go have these three hour lunches. I thought, you know, wouldn't you be too tired to go back to work? They were so energized after that. They, were, they, they then go back to work from like five until eight 
from for six to nine. You know, but part of what they were protesting about the spread of American fast food in, into their country was that we were bringing in these attitudes, attitudes towards food that they felt were very destructive to society as a whole. So, and, and destructive to, to the idea that food carries meaning. It's not just something to eat. But it's also at the same time kind of pushing out some of their indigenous foods. Yes. Which yes. is, uh, yeah, um, this is one thing I didn't touch on, but we have been more effective exporting our culture and our media than we have in terms of military conquest. I think somewhere during the 20th century, post-World War II, we realized exporting McDonald's hamburgers and Levi's was the way to really capture and dominate another, another people. You know, you, you can send in soldiers and they'll fight you. You send in hamburgers and blue jeans and they'll grab them. And they'll be seduced by them. And, and then you truly have them. They are at that point under your, you know, under your control. I think one of the th things that unites all of um, speakers is this idea that food isn't just something we eat, but it's also a part of our identity, whether, however that identity manifests. How long did you have a question? Um, what do you think about like the hamburger? Is that actually natural food or fast food in general? Like, do you think that's more of our national food? Excellent question. Uh, for many, many decades, fast food, the hamburger was fast food and vice versa. Um, starting in the 60s, you started to diversify off into chicken and fish and, and a few other things, tacos, Taco Bell. Talk, talk about American food. <laughs> um, I don't think Mexican people eat Taco Bell, do they? Not usually. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, recently, I, when I say recently, I'm coming from a different time reference than you are. In the past 25 years, um, you're right, fast food has taken on a, fast food has actually changed in a lot of ways. First of all, um, today, of course, Chipotle is fast food. You know, and then that, you know, in every way, shape, and form is different from a McDonald's hamburger. Um, but also, fast food has slowed down a little bit. You know, we don't ex necessarily expect, you know, we have Panera, we have, uh, we have Chipotle, we have a kind of a new genre of fast food, and, and which is a little bit slower food. Uh, so, excellent question. Yeah, it, it used to be, it's not anymore. Well, can I add to that? <laughs> so, um, I, think, I think in my, in my essay, in, in here, I talk about that a little bit, but in, in many ways, I would say that fast food really contains many of the ideals of, of our country, and that it cuts across race, class, ethnicity, gender, is accessible to everyone, you can find it everywhere. So in, in many ways, that's, that's very positive. It gives us something that we can all share. So um, there's the, the, the concept of a nation as being an imagined whole, well, you know, we can imagine people in California also going to Taco Bell. <laughs> you know, so so this is something that we can all share. And in that way, is that it's actually something that's, that's positive. Okay, now I'm not a spokesperson for the fast food industry and I try not to give <laughs> so, because it's it they do tend to be very destructive to local communities. They come in and wipe out local mom and pop stores. Um, at the same time, when my children were little, if we were traveling somewhere, there were very good reasons for, you know, for why everyone goes to, to the fast food places. Um, you know, so, you know, so part, part of what I try to see is there are reasons why these things developed. You know, we wanted something fast. We wanted something guaranteed. You know, if you're really hungry and you only have a dollar in your pocket, you don't want to be experimental. You know, you know we, we have to be realistic about, about human nature. So what I think we need to do now, though, is, is recognize that this is becoming hegemonic. <laughs> you know, and, and it is wiping out other aspects of our food system. Um, and most of us cannot stand up and fight the entire industry so that, that's part of the reason I like this whole tree concept. We can all make very small changes. Um, and, I, uh, and looking to see the ways in which 
in which these things have benefited us. And, and we can actually talk about the fast food industry at McDonald's as brought Americans together. So, so there are some benefits. Does that mean we want to continue that in the future? Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> There, and, and there is, there, there's a, and I can understand what you're saying, but there's also a push, you start to see in the literature now today, it's much more of a push towards um, restoration, restorative food practices instead of sustainability. Many of us believe that our food system today, including the new farm bill, um, our food system is unsustainable. We cannot keep getting a salad from 2,400 miles away. No, no way. Um, However, we know that people will go and get a convenience, a piece of convenience, and, uh, or buy convenience. And that is why Chipotle is getting locally sourced. If, if there's going to be innovation, is it going to be there? Well, we're trying to, to restore instead of sustain, it's, it's just not going to happen. Maybe if we can get back into restorative food practices uh, before globalization, which brings up an enormous question of is globalization a failure in, in food practices? And it is an absolutely necessary conversation for your generation to ask people, what is the farm bill? What is globalization doing for me? And do I want to invest in that? The most innovative people that I have interviewed in this whole field have been the um, dumpster jumpers, gorilla farmers, gorilla chicken farmers, um, people doing uh, punk rock breakfast, um, which is a breakfast out of a dumpster. These people are at national, these people are at conventions reporting on food waste um, from the streets from where where the authorities say you cannot farm like that. You can't have chickens in <coughs> Cuyahoga County. And so you have underground chicken runs. And these are young people. These are not my age, these are not older people. These are young people um, saying, I don't care what the farm bill says. I'm gonna grow my own lunch. <laughs> well, hopefully um, this discussion has given you guys lots of different things to think about, about food and how we, how we deal with food, whether we make our breakfast from dumpsters or the base White Castle, which is never really a good place. But um, I want to thank you again for coming. Um, I do have these little surveys. We're going to stick around for a few minutes, have the brownies and the punch, in case anyone has any other questions. So thanks again. Um,